Baker of Brandeis. That's who I am today. Friedel spoke to my heart because I'm an art teacher too, and she made life better for her people in the camp with art. Do you feel like you brought peace in any form to the souls condemned? The fact that we get to literally talk to someone who prosecuted at Nuremberg, not only that is the last like survivor, is definitely a unique experience, and I'm glad I was a part of it. I've always kind of been really interested in like civil rights. And, like, I think this bill in particular is very important. It's clear that uh, racism is still prevalent in society today and we're still fighting for justice of these victims. We have students able to participate in a musical type setting after school where a teaching artist from Count Basie is partnered with myself and we co-direct it. Hello and welcome. I'm Sean Spiller, the host of Classroom Close-Up New Jersey. We're living in a world where the line between right and wrong can be lost in a fog of belief and bias. However, there's growing evidence that humans are hardwired for morality. Sometimes we may just need a little spark of conscience to jumpstart it. And what better setting to teach about social conscience than the classroom? Today on our show, students are introduced to concepts like tolerance, advocacy, and justice through lessons about genocide and civil rights. A little later, we'll meet the last living Nuremberg prosecutor. But first, life is a journey. So think about what's in your suitcase. So good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mrs. Williams. But I'm not Mrs. Williams anymore. My name is Miss Friedel. And I pack my suitcase. I pack my suitcase full of art supplies today. Friedel Williams is teaching students to fight intolerance and hate by playing the part of Friedel Dicker Brandeis an Austrian artist and educator deported to Terezin by the Nazis during World War II. Permitted only a small number of belongings, deportees struggled to pack even their necessities. Friedel chose to fill her suitcases with art supplies. She decided that instead of just going and being there, she was going to make it a value. So she knew that there would be children there and she was going to teach them art. Friedel helped organize secret education classes for children imprisoned at the concentration camp. She believed expressing their emotions through art could help the children cope with the brutality all around them. In 1944, she was sent to the Auschwitz-Birkenau extermination camp, where she was murdered by the Nazis. Before leaving Terezin, she filled two suitcases with over 4,000 pieces of her students' art and hid them, to be discovered after the war. Rita was inspired by Friedel's story when she traveled to Terezin as part of a trip sponsored by the state's Commission on Holocaust Education as part of its mandate to promote Holocaust and genocide awareness in New Jersey schools. Teachers have had survivors in their classroom. They've read the books, they've seen the films. But for them to actually be on this trip really brings home the message because they smell, they see all these places. And I think it changes everyone who's on this trip forever. Friedel spoke to my heart because I'm an art teacher too, and she made life better for her people in the camp with art. But then it also brought back memories of the stories that I had heard from my family who were refugees. My parents came here in the 1950s from Estonia, and they were in the German displaced people's camps. So they had to leave their homes with a suitcase with hardly anything in it. And then I thought, well, what's in your suitcase? It can be material things, it can be those things uh, of character like courage and love and friendship and family and, and then the entire project just started to take form. So let's plan our morning meeting for December. Maybe they can make something to put in with the food truck. baskets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rita's inspiration grew into more than just her art room lessons. It became the foundation for a year's worth of projects centered around Holocaust education and a grant from the HIP Foundation to help fund them. The second grade team and I have been planning morning meetings. Each month we're going to have different topics of character ed, values, virtues that the kids can really get into. So they've already had one big morning meeting with the entire second grade where we concentrated on courage. And then in between, when they come to me for art, there's tons of art projects going on that, that go right with it. That's my mom. Uh -huh. That's my sister. That's me. My dad's going to go right here. Each of my second grade students and my fourth grade students have been working on Holocaust themed projects. So the second graders have been working on paintings where they explain what courage is. The fourth graders have been working on a remembrance project. 
Along with themed lessons, service projects, and field trips, students have the opportunity to meet Holocaust survivors like Maud Dame, who shares her memories of having to live in hiding during the German occupation of the Netherlands. I came here today to talk to the students and to explain to them of what, what I went through as a child and also to support Rita Williams, the teacher, and all the wonderful things that she's doing here with art of the Holocaust. And we've been going all through the Netherlands asking Christian families, if something should happen, would you take in Jewish children and hide them? I tried to bring a message to them of how people cared that I wouldn't be here today if people didn't care and how we have to respect each other because I, I seem to think that's lacking a lot. And I think it's important to, to talk to them about caring and how people care and risk their lives to save another individual. You don't just see something and do nothing. People stood up and did things. Did your sister ever go to school? No, neither one of us went to school. So we started school actually she was seven and I was nine, and we were both in the first grade. The students were just so amazing, and they had so many questions. I thought it was amazing, and I was like really excited to actually see someone who survived in World War II. Having Maud in our school was one of those dreams that you have as an educator where it just kind of all comes together. She has given me the courage to do different kinds of projects where maybe I would not have had the courage to do it, but she is truly my hero. And to see her in front of all those students and all those students were sitting so quietly and listening to every word, is magic. They were just so hyped up and one of them said she must have had a lot of courage to get up there and tell all of us her story. It was just really sweet. They really soaked it in, everything she was saying. Rita is hopeful that all of the lessons taught will help students develop the courage and social conscience needed to become humanitarians. We're seeing little changes in them where they're just a little bit more tolerant of each other. They're holding friendship more dear now. They're more serious about things. There's still kids having a grand old time, but some of those things are really starting to sink into their hearts. The goal here is to get students thinking and talking, which leads to deeper understanding, even inspiration to never give up. In the words of Nuremberg prosecutor Ben Ferenc, it takes courage not to be discouraged. Of course, it's one thing to quote the man, but quite another to interact with living history in a search for conscience. Being a man of vast experience, I've never been in a courtroom before. I never, never tried a case before. I said, of course. And so it came about historically that one little 27-year-old guy with no experience whatsoever became the chief prosecutor in what was certainly the biggest murder trial in human history. Meet Benjamin Ferenz, Harvard Law School graduate, World War II veteran, and Chief Prosecutor for the United States in the Einsatzgruppen case just after the end of the war, when 22 senior leaders of the paramilitary Nazi death squads were charged with murdering over a million people. All the defendants were convicted. It was Ben's first case. Lesson of the story, be bold, kids. If you know you're right, do it, even if it's never been done before. And that has always been my attitude, and that's why I'm still working at it at the age of 98. That's right, 70 years after his first trial, Ben continues to work tirelessly toward a more humane and secure world. Today, he's a guest in Terry Kuhnreich's Search for Conscience class here at Vineland High School. What the Einsatzgruppen did was genocide, and any killing, of large numbers of people because of their race, their color, or their religion is murderous conduct and should be halted and should be condemned everywhere, particularly by young people like you. He was 27 and he never gave up. He knew what was right and what was wrong. He knew that I'm gonna go against all the Einstein's group and, and I have to bring justice and that's what he did. Does he have any relatives that were part of the Great question. The Search for Conscience elective focuses on Holocaust and genocide, as well as social issues related to current events. We cover a wide variety of topics, but everything, all roads lead back to the Holocaust. Uh, we discuss diversity and racism and prejudice and hatred. We connect it to what's going on today. 
and you know people at a different level once you take this course. It's one of the most popular electives at the high school. And for Terry Kuhnreich, it's personal. But when it's a connection to you, it hits deeper. My parents were survivors. My father had a lot of strength, my mother very bright. My whole world was growing up with survivors. They gave me life lessons that can't be taught in a book. The constant among all the survivors was the concept of hope. That's right. It's like it touches close to home for him. In the world we live in today, it's kind of like very divided. And I feel like this class kind of throws that out the window. Like, we don't need to be divided. We, we should all like be able to come together and be one, because that's how stuff happens, you know? That's where the good comes from. What drove you to go along? On the day before the online interactive discussion with Mr. Ferenz, students worked together to come up with some of the questions they would be asking him. Exactly the way you said it is how you should ask Mr. Ferenz. This is Jordan. Speak nice, loud, and clear, because this here is 98 years old. <laughs> Good morning, how are you? I am great, how are you? Is that the only question? No. <laughs> okay, if you were to go back and change anything, what would you change? What I would do is I would say stop war making. That's the biggest crime of all. So I would make all wars a crime against humanity. And I need help for the young people to get that idea across in order to save your lives. I'm gonna remember him <laughs> and I'm gonna remember never give up on anything, anything I ever want to do in life, never give up. Don't forget to do it, Tom. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, during the Nuremberg trials, when Ollendorf told you that... The only way that we can prevent history from repeating itself is by learning about it. What kind of impact did that have on you? It had a very strong impact on me. There was no regret at all on the part of the mass murderers. I felt so connected to him in history. It takes courage not to be discouraged. When he talks about hate and that we all should tolerate and accept each other, it just resonates with me. It will protect the lives of everyone. The fact that we get to literally talk to someone who prosecuted at Nuremberg, not only that is the last like survivor, is definitely a unique experience and I'm glad I was a part of it. But I only could try 22 defendants for the ridiculous reason we only had 22 seats. It gives me hope that one person has the power to change everything for the better. There is still genocide today, and a lot of people tend to brush it off their shoulder if it doesn't involve them. But, you know, it's something that needs to be talked about because it doesn't matter your race, religion, sexuality, color, just people are people. I worked for 50 or 60 years to create a permanent international criminal court to carry on the work which had been done by the courts at Nuremberg. You can see in his face the history that he's witnessed. He's stuck with his beliefs. Through years and years and years of sticking with his belief, he's making a difference. A powerful experience. When we come back, students fight for justice in a memorable civil rights lesson. You won't want to miss this. I had a teacher in high school who realized that when I was reading the things they carried that I might have been using some spark notes or I wasn't completely engaged in what was going on. So he went and found a flak jacket, right? And he let me read in class with a flak jacket on, right? So, you know, he went to great lengths, right? He, he found a way to get me engaged. And I try to be that same type of teacher to the students I have now. We're still talking about issues of racial violence in our classrooms today. Maybe if we start talking about the stuff that still wasn't resolved from 50 years ago, we could start understanding why there's issues to this day. We never healed the original wounds in many cases. Partner up with somebody and update that person about where you are presently at trying to get representatives and lawmakers to meet with. Stuart Wexler and his AP government and politics class are three years into the process of getting a bill called the Civil Rights Cold Case Act made into law. We're the first high school class to ever write a law that I know of to actually get a bill introduced into the House of Representatives. 
It's now these third year students to try and take this to the finish line and get it introduced in the Senate, and hopefully through the Senate, and out of the oversight committee in the House and through the other stages of the House process. Stewart's previous classes drafted the bill, and if it becomes law, will facilitate the release of documents in unsolved civil rights cases, like the Warless Jackson and Emmett Till murders. Warless Jackson is one of many cases. You have a person in Mississippi, activist in civil rights, he's killed. There's very strong suspicion if the Silver Dollar Group had something to do with it. They were a, sort of a violent offshoot of the Klan there. Warless Jackson was killed by a car bomb, and 14-year-old Emmett Till was lynched for allegedly catcalling a white female store owner. Later, it was found out that it had actually not happened at all. She had not been catcalled, and this poor man was lynched for no reason. We feel like as if we provide context to our bill through use of Emmett Till, it would help us uh, push forward. Uh, right now, I'm working on Senator Richard Burr of North Carolina. Well, once our bill becomes law, we will find that a lot of these cases should see some sort of prosecution. There are a lot of bills that get introduced in the House, and only a few of them move on past committee. That's what we want to do. We want to move ours past committee, and that requires putting it at the top of the list. Then we spend a lot of the time actually making calls and emailing congresspeople and try and get as many appointments with actual staffers as humanly possible in hopes that we could just get on their agenda. Jenna, how can I help you? Um, hi, I was wondering if I could have a meeting with Joni Ernst on December 4th. If it's a Republican, a victim's rights group, and if it's a Democrat, a civil rights group like the NAACP, and work that angle first. I'm calling Senator Chuck Schumer right now. So we believe that he would be a good sponsor for the bill and he'd be a good way to introduce the bill into the Senate. I got a meeting with Lacey Clay. He's on the Government Oversight and Reform Committee, and he's a part of the Congressional Black Caucus, which we've received support from. The students contacted many representatives with the hopes of actually meeting with some of them during a class trip to Washington, D.C. in December of 2017. The goal was to gain as much support as possible for their bill. What do you think the results of this trip are going to be like? I expect our bill to be introduced in the Senate, to get to the agenda of the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee, and to inspire all of my students to run for public office once they're out of college. How many appointments do you have? Four. The act basically aims to give closure to the families and victims of civil rights cold cases, and it will establish a review board to oversee these files and hopefully get them released to the public eye. All we're asking is let everyday people access these files online through digital means and search and see what they can do with the, the information. What's the significance? Why do you want to get people in the state or in the district to call before we call? Yeah. Well, all politics is local, so they're likely to respond to their constituents from... My favorite thing about the class is definitely how I could interact with people that I never thought I would interact with before. So like the first time I made a phone call to a congressman, I was shaking, I was so nervous. I've always kind of been really interested in like civil rights. And, like, I think this bill in particular is very important. It's clear that uh, racism is still prevalent in society today and we're still fighting for justice of these victims. And it's a question of humanity as a whole, that these people were humans, their own family members went through this, a lot of them were killed, there were a lot of hate crimes toward them. This deserves some sort of justice. It's a sense of security and relief to see that something's being done. I want them to learn firsthand what the legislative process is like on the ground, real world, not just the charts that you give them that show the stages. If a high school class can do that, what could everyday Americans do? What can I do later on in my life if I really feel that there's something that can be done to make something happen in the country? And you think that people who lost their loved ones should know what happened to their people. If I was one of those people, I'd want to know what happened to my family. And I think it's important that we take this as an, as an issue and we pass it because it's something that I think it's our duty to do.
takes a village means to me that all students need every resource possible in order to be successful. For the Red Bank Borough Public Schools, it means us taking advantage of the resources that are available in both Red Bank and outside of Red Bank in Greater Monmouth County. We have all these organizations that have reached out to us and we've reached out to specific organizations like the Fresh Fruits and Vegetables, Count Basie, YMCA, Horizons, United Way. They provide swimming, they provide food, they provide supplies, and the students really enjoy and appreciate everything that these organizations give to us. They come into our schools and allow the students to have experiences that they otherwise would not have. Here's the audition for the crocodile. You're simply going to take your arms up nice and big. You're going to give them a quick snap like the mouth. And you're going to say, yeah. We worked on a little play called the elephant and the crocodile. Let's try it one more time. One, two, three. Oh, you're perfect. I gave them a chance to audition so they start to understand what the word audition means and how to create a role and then I'm teaching them how to do lines. Knows what you say when I go like this. And movement. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The great thing about this is it really helps with their self-confidence. We feel that it's really important to come here to teach the students, work with the students, because they might not otherwise have had the opportunity to grow, to um, experience the benefits of arts education, which is hugely impactful on their lives. That's how you would feel, but we can't be that loud because we have to hear the next line. So we have students able to participate in a musical type setting after school where a teaching artist from Count Basie is partnered with myself and we co-direct it. Love in your heart. Move around, come on, move, move. The world will be a better. Our mantra is dream big, we'll help you get there. And without these partnerships, we would not be able to fulfill that mantra on a daily basis so effectively. Our Education Foundation has given us so many different resources. They have given us the Chromebooks and iPads. How many butterflies did they catch? I think that we play a pretty important role now. Um, we've shown that we can raise money and we can meet special needs that the schools have. Take a look at the more tougher problems and see if you can make a model to represent those. The foundation has greatly benefited us. We are so grateful to have this opportunity to be able to use iPads and Minecraft in the classroom because it really is an extension of how they're learning. If you do this one, please show me with expanded form after you've already plugged in the answer. A lot of them don't have access to Chromebooks or computers in any other form other than school, so their excitement about learning is increased so much and their motivation for learning is increased so much just because of the funness of it all. Sickles Farm is a partnership through the Fresh Fruits and Vegetables program, and that allows us to bring fresh food and fruits and vegetables into the classroom for the students to try. And who'd ever had a persimmon before we sent, was, sent some over to the school? Red Bank School does the program in an exceptional manner. They deliver the fruits and vegetables to the children in their classrooms. They're distributed by the students and they try to run it as many times a week as they possibly can. My job is to deliver fruits to my friends. We receive the fruit and vegetables actually twice a week. Hi, good morning everyone. Good morning. So glad to be here today. We are the lucky partners that Red Bank chose to provide their fruits and vegetables. And um, I was here just to kind of review with the children what they've gotten. They're very good in vitamin C and that's very important to have right now because it helps you fight off flus and colds and things. So make sure you enjoy your orange today. Friends, are you ready? Yeah. Let's try one, two, and three. It's so I think it's a wonderful program that we're involved in and I hope to see it continue in the years to come because introducing them to these new fruits and vegetables that they can incorporate maybe in their home life is a, a great thing. The United Way is another great organization that helps supply school supplies for our students, especially since we are a lower social economic student population. Our parents are not always able to provide the basic necessities at home. You like that one? Today, Tim Hearn from the United Way came to visit my classroom, and we were lucky enough to receive some backpacks and some school supplies for the children. It feels 
Teachers have indicated to us that they have experiences where kids are not coming to school prepared with school supplies. And all we want is the kids to be equal. Get that. Is that your favorite color? Teachers have also indicated in the winter, the kids don't have boots, don't have coats, they're not coming to school, they're cold. So we partner with our corporations, our donors, and match up and we get coats and, and boots and supplies to make sure the kids come to school and that when they walk in the door, they're equal. I really think we allow our students to dream big by giving them the village. And the fact that we have all these opportunities for our students, they can dream bigger than they ever could dream before. Providing high quality learning environments and experiences often are influenced by factors beyond the control of educators. As we've seen, partnerships are good for schools, providing meaningful youth engagement and good for the community organizations who are giving back, connecting with the next generation and providing opportunities for a brighter future. If you'd like to watch more stories like these, check out our video library at classroomcloseup.org and join us next time to learn all about the business of running a greenhouse. That and so much more on our next episode. Until then, for Classroom Close-Up New Jersey, I'm Sean Spiller. See you soon. Class dismissed.